Good morning. My name is Philip Bain. I'm the Managing Director of Smart Cities Council. And today we're continuing our work, if I can get my slides up, on uh, the mitigating of the impact of urban flooding on vulnerable populations in uh, Nashville. Do want to announce that uh, Nashville was selected by a global panel of judges and public voting as one of our 2021 Smart City Readiness Challenge winners. It was partly because of the significant work they did last year, not only on uh, this particular project, mitigating the impact of urban flooding, but also um, for those of you that have read our articles, you know that they also passed a significant transportation bill. And of course, like many of us have um, suffered through cascading crises throughout the year. So it's there really is a nod here to Nashville's leadership and the work that it's done. And I just want to acknowledge that before we get started. So if you have any questions or if you're seeking access to Smart Cities Activator or to participate in the readiness program, uh, if, if you're a city, please contact Connie Heath. And if you're a solution provider or an expert from a university, we've had many universities speak, Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt throughout this process, uh, please feel free to contact us and we'll find, we'll find a way to get you engaged. So I just want to remind everybody why we're here. This is a slide from the Department of Homeland Security, who was one of our expert presenters uh, in the winter of this past year. And um, it's just all about the risk that we face here in North America and the United States from uh, urban flooding. It kills more people, it causes more damage, damage than any other disaster um, in the United States, and the chances of um, your community being flooded are even greater today than they were 10, 20 years ago. So I just want to remind everybody here that this is a significant crisis that cities face and, um, you know, Nashville is leading this readiness cohort to help um, find ways to mitigate the impact not only on infrastructure and on the population, but I think most importantly on vulnerable populations, which we'll discuss briefly today. So what is our goal with this program? Um, we found over the years, and you'll see the number of programs we've done with different cities, that sometimes cities have a hard time converting knowledge to action. Finding all the right resources and expertise and solutions can take a lot of time and a lot of money, and then getting them to the ground and getting them implemented through a you know, sometimes um, arcane procurement process can be really difficult. And so what we, our singular goal at the Smart Cities Council is to help cities accelerate their project implementation. We figure if a city can um, go from five, four to five years in, in, in project implementation to two to three years, that the residents win, the cities win, solution providers win, and those financing the projects win. And this is a global problem. I mean, we're actually fairly lucky in the United States that we get to projects implementation fairly quickly, but outside of the developed world, it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 years before you actually see project implementation. So that, that's one of our key goals here is to help cities uh, implement their projects. And sometimes saying no to a project is actually a good thing because then it allows you to prioritize other projects. Our process is that we run a challenge every quarter we select two or three cities and we start a process. And I'll, I'll tell you quickly about the ongoing work that's going to start uh, in the coming month. So these are all the cities that we've worked with in the last uh, four years, cities from Philadelphia all the way down. As you can see, Nashville and Brisbane and Orange County down at the bottom of the list. And we have found continuously that cities and states uh, like Virginia, territories like Puerto Rico, I found it really productive uh, in us helping them implement the accelerate the implementation of their projects. So the current winners coming out of the last um, readiness challenge in 2020 were Nashville, as I have described, but also Orange County and uh, Brisbane in Australia. As you all know, we're focusing on urban flooding with Nashville. Um, it's going to culminate in an activator roadmap or plan, which I'll show you or, and describe. And then we're also going to have an in-person scoping charrette when it's safe. With Orange County, we're focusing on smart and healthy buildings. They're particularly interested in using American Rescue Act funding to fund innovative economic development 
that actually makes their built environment safer and healthier. Uh, Brisbane, Australia is actually leading a global effort on data governance. It's really fascinating what they're doing and it's led by Smart Cities Council, Australia, New Zealand with our executive director, Adam Beck. In that situation, we're also gonna culminate with activator roadmaps and then um, sort of a twinkle in our eye is a digital twin week in October, which will be a hybrid event, virtual and hosted, out of Brisbane and Orlando. So if you're interested in any of these other uh, projects that we have going on, uh, please feel free to contact us. We'll be rolling out the next quarter's challenge next week, and from there, we'll pick up more projects. We usually pick up 30 to 40 projects that we review, and then we'll select the winners going into the uh, third quarter. So what's the key information to date that we've learned? Um, I'm sort of proud to say that if you go do a Google search on Nashville urban flooding, all you're gonna get is the work that we've been doing with Nashville. Um, so if you just do a simple Google search, uh, Nashville urban flooding, you will see every one of our recorded sessions, you'll see the articles, uh, the people that are here today, you'll have seen them present and speak about the situation in Nashville. You'll also hear from other experts, Georgia Tech, Vanderbilt University, a SAS Institute, I'll name them all shortly, but this is a simple way, you don't even have to go to our website, just do a Google search. Now in terms of the knowledge that we've shared so far, we've had the cities of Savannah, Cleveland, Cary, and Charlotte share information, and we've had experts from Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, Department of Homeland Security, Hi-Fi sensors, IntelliSense, Green Screen Technologies, Ot Hydro, Aqua Informatics, and SAS Institute. So as you can see, we've had a pretty broad brush of different types of speakers talk about urban flooding, the issues and the solutions. Now, what, the other thing that we learned that was really interesting that came out of this was the changing science and technology around low cost sensors. Now, for me, having worked in the smart grid back in the 80s and 90s, I was a little surprised at how sort of this was a budding field in the area of water infrastructure management, because any of you that have worked in energy or electricity in the smart grid are fully familiar with the fact that we were um, moving, the, we were changing the world's largest analog network, that is our grid, into the world's largest digital network, and we were doing it with lower cost sensors. But now it's penetrating the water infrastructure market and DHS gave a very good presentation about this. And again, if, if you wanna see more about this, just go look at the Google search and you'll find where uh, Dr. Alexander talked um, from DHS and, and the slides uh, are totally available. But it's really interesting, and Roger Lindsay was on here, has talked about how Nashville has used uh, traditional stream gauge USGS scientific sensors, which are fairly expensive, and uh, Nashville worked out with DHS to, to get access to about 25 or 30 of these low cost sensors so that they could start experimenting because they have a watershed of about, I think it's 630 miles, but I know Tom or Roger will correct me. Um, so anyway, this was one of the real findings that we uh, discovered was the fact that these low cost sensors could really change how a city went about managing um, and mitigating urban flooding. Another thing we learned was, um, and this came from the town of Cary, who won an IDC award on a smart water project two years ago. And that was the fact that um, cities should really focusing, focus on integrating best of breed. And I think of all the probably three to 350 slides we had uh, in the last six sessions, this was probably one of the most popular because it just simply showed uh, Cary's focus on integrating multiple solutions from many different solution providers, some that they were already using like Esri and Salesforce, but then they brought in others like Azure, Del Boomi, SaaS Analytics. Um, they brought these in and then they also used some of um, IoT sensors from Greenstream and IntelliSense. So it was, it was just a really interesting slide that every one of you should take home if you're in a city and if you're a solution provider, you should take a serious look at this and say, how do we fit in this puzzle? Can we play well with all of these different players and can we offer distinctive benefits? So this was a clear learning from our work. The third piece of learning, um, and we, have, we owe a lot to both Jennifer Higgs, uh, who's in the ITGIS department and 
Dr. Janie Campbell from Vanderbilt was some of the focus we put on vulnerable communities. And if you'll notice on the left-hand side, and, and you'll see this in a second in Smart Cities Activator, we identified vulnerable communities, uh, low-income, children, communities, of color, immigrants, and seniors. One of the communities that CDC Social Vulnerability Index does not um, uh, indicate or have data on are renters. And uh, Dr. Janie Camp is, is actually publishing a, a paper on this about um, how they make up a vulnerable community, especially in Nashville. And if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see a graphic rendering and you can see the river where my cursor is going through. And then if you look at the really dark red where my cursor is right now, you'll see that these are, we've been able to identify these are rental properties that are at risk. And this is one of the findings we found. Now, of course, one of the things that happens with rental properties is that they tend to have um, immigrants, community of color, um, seniors. So it's it's sort of a it's not only a question of um, of locating and finding other vulnerable communities, but also understanding that that may be a place where they uh, many of them are. And the reason we identify them as vulnerable in this context is from the standpoint of communication. And um, in the fact that um, many of the owners of the rental properties would get notices about flooding mitigation, but they would not share it with their tenants. And so this became you know, a clear indicator for the city about some action that we had to take. So that was sort of the third learnings. And just repeating them, one was the low-cost sensor. The second was um, the fact that you could integrate best-of-breed solutions. And the third, looking at the ultimate sort of mitigating um, action that we were trying to do, was identifying a new vulnerable community, and that was renters. So what I want to go to now, I'm just going to change my screen, is go to Smart Cities Activator. Let's see if you guys can see it. You can. This is the work um, that we're doing right now, and I just want to show everybody this because this is something that if you're a city, and you participate in our programs, you get for free. And it's a really powerful um, strategic planning tool. So for instance, you'll notice up here in the left-hand corner, I have Nashville Equitable Approaches to Urban Flooding, but I also have some other City Innovation District Strategic Example. Abergo, Abergo Online is actually the capital of Nigeria. The 2020 COVID-19 Mitigation Roadmap was one um, plan that we created to help cities mitigate the impact of uh, COVID-19 on vulnerable populations. It was downloaded by 30 cities and used to kickstart their plans. You can see there's some other plans. And um, what happens is, you'll notice, I'm going to come down here to example projects just to show you sort of the breadth of, if you're a city and you come on, you're going to be able to see a lot of example projects. Um, that, that you can use. And if you're a solution provider and you want to start doing product development or solution discovery, you can also come and use this, though you don't get it for free. But the beauty of this is, so for instance, let's say I'm a city and I want to do a design thinking strategic plan. I can come here and I can create a project template from this example, and it gets me a kickstart and almost paint by the numbers approach to, uh, to starting a plan. So I'm gonna go back up to sort of my favorites because this is, these are the ones I'm working on right now. And um, I'll just show you, for instance, the City Innovation District before I go to Nashville. This is something where you can copy the project, you could export it for a customer or a senior uh, management to see. You can share a read-only version of it. You could also create a template. But what it allows you to do is if you create this, you can basically, you'll have a paint by the numbers approach to a project. So for instance, um, just showing you in high level ecosystem view, um, this is something that if you were interested in creating an innovation district, you could copy this into your uh, workspace and you could get started. And for our Orange County work, which is about making the whole city an innovative workspace, um, we would just copy this particular plan and then get started. So that's just an example how a city at no cost to itself can use Smart Cities Activator. So now I'm going to go to what we're doing with Nashville. And you'll notice that in all the 
sort of example projects we had, we didn't have anything about flooding. So what we're particularly, and Nashville's agreed to this, is we're putting together a plan. And when we're finished with this, um, any city in the world could come and copy this into their workspace and start their own planning. So as you can see, we're looking at, uh, you know, and we have things like here, you'll notice that you can embed video. So we were able to put in the speech from uh, Mayor Cooper that kicked this off. Uh, Mayor Deming is going to kick off our Orange County work on April 15th, and we'll add that. You'll notice that we were able to put in graphics. We've also put in some matrices about how we're looking at this. I'm really proud of the work we've done on identifying stakeholders in the community. This is really a key piece of any work if you want to be successful, is identifying all of the entities that would be uh, that need to be at the table so that you can have a successful project. You'll notice we've included solution providers, nonprofits, and government agencies. And so, as you can see, it's sort of like a storyboard, but it's online, it's collaborative. We've had as many, at one time, we had 20 people from Baltimore working on one of these, and they were all in different locations um, working on the plan. Excuse me for that. Um, so anyway, so this is just an example of the work we're doing, and when it finally is finished, you will be able to, um, uh, if you're a city anywhere in the world, you'll be able to download this and start your own um, approach to mitigating the impact of urban flooding. So with that, um, I'm going to save questions to the end. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to turn this over to Chris Thompson from Xylem. And he's going to present their sort of equitable and their new equitable lens on water solutions. And then we also have um, currently on our panel um, Roger Lindsay, Jennifer Higgs, uh, Dr. Camp, and Tom Palco from Nashville uh, who will ask questions. Um, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So right now I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to give you the, um, just give me a second here. All right. There you go, Chris. All right. I uh, hope you see my screen. We do. All right, terrific. Well, Phil, thank you uh, for the introduction, and, and thank you all for, uh, for taking the time today. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and also uh, introduce uh, Christine Boyle uh, from Xylem. Uh, first, myself, I'm vice president of what we call practice management in Xylem, and that's a, that's a team that we have now that is really integrating our solutions our digital solutions, as well as uh, some of the, the solutions I'll talk about today uh, to help solve these problems, help solve the digital problems, the data problems, and really uh, your concerns. And so uh, I'm excited uh, to be here uh, with Christine Boyle. Christine is joining us uh, from, from the West Coast, uh, but uh, she's got some roots uh, here on the East Coast. Uh, Christine is the vice president of our business incubation team. Uh, she's, a, she's a water economist and also an entrepreneur. Uh, she spent her career really helping utilities build uh, financial resilience. Uh, we're going to introduce her, her current, uh, most recent project, uh, which is a, a water, uh, water equity lens for utilities to use. Uh, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Uh, and hopefully, I think uh, Christine may be back next month to go into some deeper depth around uh, the equity lens. So. Uh, so I want to uh, introduce you to uh, uh, really what we wanted to, to cover here. And I, Roger, I, I'm sorry, Philip, I know you uh, talked about the Cary slide, uh, and I saw, I did watch the, the Cary presentation, uh, which was a really intriguing presentation. And the town of Cary is actually a, a customer of ours also uh, when we talk about the, uh, the smart utility network or the AMI network. Uh, and I'll, touch base on, on your network as city of Nashville. Uh, but uh, just uh, as an executive summary, I wanted to cover, we want to talk and introduce uh, the water equity lens to you today, which is a nascent project that uh, Christine has recently kicked off and we're really excited about what that can do for utilities like Nashville. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, your network and this smart utility network uh, that can be used for a number of functions. Uh, you know, first, I'll talk about how it uh, can bring you valuable information around water consumption 
and, and some unique features of, of some other alarms and data. Uh, talk to you about how it's being used by cities like yourself to identify issues around storm water and flooding, uh, some early warning sign type systems. Uh, talk ab about how it can be really used with some third-party sensors and even some of the metrology that, that is offered uh, for things like monitoring water pressure, uh, monitoring water temperature for freeze prevention, and things like that, all of which can help uh, communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, save water and save, save on the water bill. Uh, and then some water quality applications. And then, like I said, we're, we're, we've built and we're, we're building uh, applications, advanced analytics applications to help in other areas. So I'll, I'll touch on uh, drinking water operations, uh, sewer overflow awareness and prevention and public awareness, and uh, also public flooding awareness, because I know that's a real concern of yours, uh, given the floods from, from May of 2010. But first, I uh, want to define uh, what, what, what we mean by water equity, and, and we really use the, the U.S. Water Alliance definition for water equity which is when communities have access to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water. And, and from, the, from my side, from, from the utility uh, side, uh, that leads me to things like uh, water quality monitoring, for example, uh, water affordability, uh, which can be impacted by, uh, by system-wide spending needs that we can hope, hope to minimize through some of the tools, but also on a personal customer level, can be impacted by, by things like chronic leaks uh, that are driving up their water bills. So uh, there is a, a way or, or several things I'll touch on later that can touch on that, uh, that safe, clean and affordable water. Uh, also, these utilities and, and communities are resilient in the face of floods. Uh, and I'll take you through those use cases around uh, other, other systems or, or using sensors and, and, and data accumulators uh, to be able to have that early warning sign and also trend for future events. Uh, and then uh, it's also when communities have a role in decision making. So I'll talk later about tools to help cities like Nashville manage your water operations, uh, monitor your wa uh, water quality. And finally, it's, it's all meant uh, so that everyone in the utility uh, service area can share in the economic, social, and environmental benefits of the, of the water system. So the water equity lens is uh, going to utilize that U.S. Water Alliance framework. Uh, they have three pillars uh, that they look at in terms of water equity. Uh, that is access, which includes those things I just mentioned around affordability and water quality. Uh, benefit, uh, customer benefit, community benefit, which accounts for the economic and, and social results from water access. And then resilience, which I know is top of mind uh, for you uh, along the Cumberland River. And, and that's uh, where we could uh, talk about monitoring, planning, and assessment to make you more able to handle uh, climatic events uh, like floods, like, like the increasing number of severe storms we have. I know here in the, uh, in the North Carolina areas, the number of 10-inch rains in a 24-hour period seems to just be, be growing uh, continuously. So I know it's a continuous uh, concern of the utilities. So let, let me take you and talk to you a little bit about your ne network, uh, which is uh, very, uh, very intriguing, very very similar to other networks that we've built uh, uh, for customers. Uh, and so I wanted to, wanted to show you one, the, the service area, for, for example. This is a network that's built on, uh, on primary spectrum uh, radio. Uh, we call it, in, in Xylem, we call it a, a system called FlexNet. Uh, the system uh, underneath that system gives you a lot of uh, flexibility, a lot of creativity to, uh, to capture data that you can use for for operations, for planning, and for those water equity uh, issues that we just uh, described. So under this uh, umbrella, for example, you can have smart meters, and I've pictured one there, uh, where you can continuously uh, accumulate consumption data. Uh, this can identify for customers, it, this can help identify things like anomalies, like bursts in the home, uh, reverse flow activity that might impact water quality, uh, but it's really useful information that can alarm not only you, but also the customer about problems happening at the property line at the meter site. Uh, it can provide alarms, like I said, for a uh, uh, for customer who's struggling. Maybe if there's continuous flow, there, there are sensors in the, in the, in the meter that, that let us know that there's a continuous chronic leak at the home, which might be driving up their water bills. Uh, so there are alarms associated with that, with that type of uh, continuous usage that the meter would see. Uh, in addition, uh, their, their customer portals, I know I went online, I think you have a, a customer portal in the city. 
uh, to provide uh, user data, user information. We have customers who use that, and then consumers who use that to create a water budget for themselves, uh, sort of alert themselves when they're when they're reaching their monthly maximum uh, expected water use, so they can minimize their bills. Uh, so some really interesting analytics behind the scenes that can provide customer-facing information for them. Uh, so uh, these meters even have, uh, some meters even have temperature sensors and pressure sensors, and I'll, and I'll get into how those can help uh, your consumers and how they can help operations. And then you'll see uh, that, that particular meter, the, uh, the Ally meter has uh, a remote shut off and cut on capability. And I would say uh, traditionally uh, before COVID, I personally always thought of the remote cutoff uh, functionality of that. Uh, uh, to be able to provide some flexibility, some remoteness to the water operation. But, but you know, during COVID, that we also had a had an issue where customers who had previously been cut off in other systems, we had to turn them back on, and that meant crews being dispatched to to physically go to the property lines. And I think it's a good use case also to think about turning on customers in the event of a of a major issue. So I thought that was an interesting twist on that functionality. Uh, then we'll I'll talk about underneath this umbrella again. Uh, we can build uh, a network of sensors, third-party sensors uh, for things like pressure, level, water quality. I'll, I'll touch on the on the uh, on those, and then you can see the stormwater. I'll show you examples of, of utility in just a second. Who's, who's doing that? So really unique features, and, and so I, I think the takeaway for this slide, uh, what I'd like to leave you as Nashville is, you have a lot of the capability already because of the of the network you're building. Uh, to read your water meters. We call it a smart utility network because it's not just a traditional AMI system because you can build on some of the other functionality that you see on the screen here. So one customer who has, has a similar system, uh, this is Walla Walla, Washington, uh, which is fun to say. Uh, it's in southeastern uh, Washington. They have uh, chronic seasonal uh, issues around flooding. Uh, Snowmelt uh, provides a lot of uh, capabilities for them to have some flooding events. They also have this Mill Creek, which you can see is a uh, sort of a containerized stream in the middle of town. Uh, and, and they also have, as part of that, you can see in the distance in that one picture, uh, several low-lying uh, bridges with some bridge abutments that can cause some additional turbulence. Uh, things, logs can get blocked up against there and cause the water level to rise. So, so they wanted to utilize, they were a forward-thinking utility. They wanted to utilize the network and some third-party sensors to be able to bring this information back around Mill Creek, because they said occasionally this, this creek will have flash floods that, that impact downtown. And so they did, uh, again, very uh, creative, uh, able utility. Uh, they had uh, level sensors, so they purchased level sensors to, to be underneath that network umbrella. Here are those abutments I talked about. They wanted to sort of understand uh, levels upstream and downstream of these bridge abutments. So they installed them. You can see they did some nice uh, encapsulation of the cables so they would be uh, safe and robust. And then they, uh, they have a gateway. That, that gateway can communicate over that same network that, that meters communicate over. So, uh, so they wanted to sort of build these along Mill Creek so they would have some understanding of potential flooding events so they could be notified. They could then uh, understand what the impact might be for traffic or for citizens. Uh, and, and so this is an event. This is actually a snow melt event. On, there's a video which is actually pretty scary just to view just the turbulence and, and the tumult of the, of the water rolling down the hill here through Mill Creek. But you can see what it, what it enabled them to do is understand before there was a, a crest or before there was a, a major issue, it gave them some ability to see that the, the water levels were starting to ramp up over time. And this is that third party sensor just communicating uh, occasional level readings or pressure readings through that radio across the network and then into the user interface you see on the screen. So just an example of how you can utilize that network uh, that you are, are growing now for meter reading and, and use it for some other applications uh, to, to help with water equity, to help with flooding in this case. And those things can be built in. Uh, you can see they have alarms that can be sent, uh, uh, you know, text messages that can be sent as, as part of that early, early warning system as well. So that's on, on the stormwater and flooding side. That's a, a way that we can utilize some of those sensors. I know, Philip, you mentioned earlier about uh, some of the USGS sensors and things, uh, but this is one example of a utility uh, kind of taking some initiative and putting it underneath that umbrella. 
also in terms of drinking water systems uh, you know that that's where a, a lot of uh, at least from the census side and the meter side uh, where things are but I want to touch on some some things where we could utilize that same network uh, to, to monitor for other issues that impact water equity and also water operations uh, we talked about the meters already but but I wanted to show you uh, in terms of the drinking water network out in the street out in the pipes uh, it can also be bringing back information that's valuable there. Uh, and, and really it's a, a holistic pressure monitoring network that can be built again underneath that umbrella. You can see this is Walla Walla as well. Uh, they, they deployed a number of third party sensors uh, with radios and a number of ally meters, uh, those meters that can capture uh, pressure. And they deployed them, they arrayed them across their distribution network, again, to get that sort of broad brush holistic view of water pressure in the system. Uh, so the uh, customer benefit or the, the benefit to your consumers uh, could be things like, like you see here. This is a, uh, a graph, uh, and it's kind of small on the screen, but, but what they deployed is you can see some sensors in a, in a large meter there at the top of the screen. Uh, that's a large commercial industrial meter where they, where they pushed in a, a third party sensor and also a residential meter there, which has sensor capabilities. And in this case, for example, there was a customer complaining. There's a, there's a small green uh, line that's sort of the lowest of the low there. There, there were continuous customer complaints about pressure issues uh, at their home at certain parts of the day. And they were able to actually identify uh, where those were located, uh, other customers that were, were in that same area. And also uh, they were then able to go and, and talk with customers. There were actually some some folks using some irrigation systems that were causing a big a drawdown of demand and therefore a drawdown in pressure that would uh, that would con continually impact these customers. So it's a way of at the property line identifying some issues uh, that might be impacting customers adversely. Chris. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, this is Phil. So just going back to that slide for a second, um, one of the things that Charlotte reported um, and they were funded somewhat by DHS, so they did a big report, and it's in, included in our material, was that sometimes this ability to measure pressure will um, will create new use cases, or you'll find out that there's um, either an outflow or an inflow that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that? And you were mentioning this particularly, um, and of course, this can fly into, I mean, we talk about these big crises, urban flooding, but you can also have sort of micro flooding or flash flooding. So I'm assuming some of these sensors would be able to capture that. Is that correct? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the the more the more you sense, the more things pop up that you didn't know were out there. And it's really it's been it's been interesting as we've deployed more sensors. Uh, and I'll give you an example. We have a customer who grew organically. Uh, it's a city that grew organically through through multiple developments, annexations, and and in that growth, they were sort of constantly kind of leapfrogging the, the water system. To accommodate for that growth, building new pressure zones to accommodate different elevations and things, and they 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 would have issues. Uh, there are there are valves in the system, and I'll touch on on the next slide. There are things called uh, pressure reducing valves, which are kind of small little dams in the pipes to sort of hold back those high pressures and create that uh, create a balance in the system. And, and they noticed uh, by monitoring throughout the system that that some of those valves weren't working properly, and that they had uh, pressure, uh, much higher pressures and much lower pressures than their water model, their, their the water model they had was showing them. So, so that's one example. It's also, as you're monitoring pressure, if, if you have a pipe burst, you'll see a, a rapid decline in pressure uh, in that particular de development. So we've seen that as well, where, where just by having these, these sensors out in the street, you'll see some anomalies and even some bursts that they can uh, be alarmed by. Uh, other ideas, you know, the, the temperature sensor in there, you know, some homes are, are uh, can have some, when, when things ice up and when you get freezing, uh, you can have some problems with pipes bursting and service lines bursting. So you can set alarms with a temperature sensor to be able to, to prevent that from happening. So again, you know, thinking about the water equity piece, you know, you, know, you don't want uh, homes flooding and the damage, the ensuing damage. We have the capability now to, you know, to put a sensor on, on on the property line and, and monitor for temperatures. Hope that answers your question. I think, it, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. The, the more you see underground, you know, it's all underground, right? A lot of it's underground. Uh, the uh, 
the more you see, the more correlations you start to see, which has really been fascinating. Yeah. Any other questions? We could uh, get a few more slides, and we could open up for broader questions. I'll do that then. So uh, this is that, uh, that that PRV example, pressure reducing valve. Again, there, there are features in your water system, uh, whether it's at, uh, at a tank or at a, at a booster station or at a pressure reducing valve, where knowing the pressure is pretty key. Uh, pressure does a lot of things, uh, it kind of makes the world go around in a water system. Uh, you know, it's, it's indicative of fire protection for, for parts of your community because the more pressure you have, the more fire capacity you have. Uh, it, it's indicative of water quality. You want to maintain good pressure to keep to keep the good water in and the bad water out. Uh, so, uh, so that's and just the, the general availability of water is is good. So, there's some regulations around pressure, but really it's it's a key parameter to monitor uh, underground. And this is an example of a utility again had had one of these valves where it was a pressure reducing valve, where it's kind of holding back the high pressure coming down the hill to make it a man of manageable pressure for homes uh, to be able to serve and, and uh, service lines to be to be okay, not to not to be blowing anything out. And this is an example of just a sensor in, in that vault was able to pick up when that valve started to fail and sort of locked open. And that could cause breaks and, and damage to service lines and breaks in the street, which, you know, again, that adds cost to your system. It adds, uh, it's another impact on affordability as well. Uh, Customers also, uh, you know, depending on where you are in your network, you can have some some water age or water quality issues. Uh, this is one customer who who wanted to identify with some sensors. This is a, a beefier sensor uh, for sure. This is a water. Uh, this is a chlorine analyzer, which requires some AC power. Uh, but they wanted to understand what the chlorine residual was at the at the dead ends of their system. Uh, you know, we, we we provide all this water out in the, out in the piping networks. And then uh, if it's not used frequently, you know, downtown areas, often you don't have issues with, with aging water because people are using it and it's constantly turning over in the system. But sometimes in disadvantaged communities, sometimes at, at dead ends, uh, sometimes at the far ends of communities, you do get depletion of, of chlorine and, and depletion of, of disinfectant that can cause things like taste and odor issues and, and even other issues. So this customer wanted to understand what was going on at the dead ends of their system so they could more, uh, sort of manage their flushing program. You use less water in flushing than they were currently using. Uh, and then another customer, uh, this is in upstate South Carolina, wanted to deploy some sensors, uh, in this case, to just understand uh, what their raw water quality was at the river. This this is a, one of the two rivers they utilize, uh, but they're monitoring things like pH and, uh, and some other parameters there. Again, kind of under that umbrella of the network. So, hey Chris, uh, I'm not an expert at this. This is Phil, but um, so you know, some of the sensors we looked at in the winter were were more assessing the height of the water and stuff. Um, so this may be a stupid question, but do you combine sensors, or are they? Does each use sensor have its own unique use case? Uh, it's a good question. Typically, uh, typically you have on that one. Then okay. What's that? <laughs> Thanks for bailing me out. Okay, I oh, thought no, it was no. a question. <laughs> no, I mean, typically, you, you know, a sensor is giving you uh, one piece of data. Uh, you know, I would say you have a pressure sensor that's monitoring for pressure. Uh, level sensor is very similar, right? It's just monitoring the, the, the pressure on top of the sensor. There are some uh, some cases where we have uh, use cases. Uh, we have a, a, a one of our, our brethren or colleagues is a company called Yellow Springs International or YSI. Uh, YSI has what they call multi-parameter multi-parameter sound, uh, which is a multi-parameter sensor for monitoring water quality, like you see here. Uh, algae is is becoming more and more of a concern in, in different uh, because of climate change and because of uh, you know increasing heat, increasing nutrient runoff. So those multi-parameter sounds have have five, four, you know, three, four, five sensors in them to monitor things like oxygen and temperature and algae count. Uh, so uh, I guess it varies, uh, Philip, depending on the application. But you uh, you often have uh, one sensor for one purpose, uh, and then you have a multi-parameter. The other point I'll make is sometimes you need a sensor. You know, the pressure sensor, as I talked about so far, are monitoring pressure, you know, on a on a regular basis, but not rapidly. 
And sometimes you want the same sensor to monitor rapidly for different use cases. So not only number of sensors, but also the rapidity with which you're sensing some, sometimes is changes by use case. In, in the pressure case, we would be picking up things like transients, we call it, but we could go down a rabbit hole and talk about that. So I hope I, hope I answered that question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, so a couple other things. So what else can data do for you? Uh, what else can, can analytics do for you? Just want to touch on a few uh, solutions here uh, where we're, we, we as Xylem have, have converted sort of raw data, uh, analyzed it and converted it to information, processed it for, for purposes of either evaluation by the utility or public, uh, public announcement. This is a, a customer of ours in, um, in Ohio, Defiance, Ohio, where we've instituted a, a program of evaluating their sewer capacity with sensors. You can see there in the lower left. Uh, we then can take that information and build a digital twin of what's going on underground, dependent on, on how what the storms are and what the storm frequency and the severity is, so that we get a really crisp idea of their sewer capacity and when overflows, sewer overflows, are occurring into the river. Uh, in this case, the dashboard is a is a public facing dashboard. It's a uh, it's a website where they are monitoring uh, certain sites. There are some icons on here where we actually have a sensor and others based on that digital twin, we've modeled what's going on. And so you can see the circles and the triangles. Some are sensors, some are actually kind of virtual sensors. It's a model telling that. But then the green is showing that currently at this system, they didn't have sewer overflowing. If they do have overflows into the, into the river, these would appear red and stay on to alert the community that they're having some, some water quality issues that they might want to avoid. So that's that's one uh, solution where we have some not only not only now are we sensing the data but we're converting that data to a model behind the scenes we're giving the utility some intelligence and also uh, some customer alerts uh, similarly uh, this is in uh, Hampton Roads in the Tidewater area of Virginia uh, this is a customer who wanted to understand uh, road surface uh, flooding conditions um, and so this is a project that we're embarking on with them to monitor uh, street flooding, to monitor uh, flooding on the streets, and then convert that into uh, public-facing information, uh, third-party apps, uh, so that they are their traffic apps on on a, on a consumer's uh, phone as as he or she's driving down the road would alert them of flooding, so they could reroute or change direction. Uh, again, you you mentioned the safety concerns around flooding. Certainly, driving uh, and flooding is a, is a huge issue, and and this particular area of the country, similar to you in, in the 2010 event, has become very very concerned around things like king tides and, and some of the some of the issues they've had with just severe storms. Uh, and then the last one I'll touch on is, this is actually happening uh, in, in your city now. We're, we're excited about this. This is a, uh, a, s a solution where we're providing some, some operational views of, of your water network, so you kind of understand what's going on in, in real time. Uh, it's also a system as, as we work together to help you save energy, uh, save uh, improve water age. Uh, and so uh, we're very thankful and very fortunate uh, uh, that you're working with us on this prototype project where we're, we're putting uh, some of that information, some of that analytics to work in real time operation to, to improve your cost, improve it, the cost to your consumers, but also, like I said, improve the quality of the water by, by balancing water age and things. So, so this I'm is really an actual about project, that. Chris. This is an actual project that Xylem is doing with Nashville right now. It is, yeah. It's okay. a it's a prototype uh, project that we've been working on. As is the meter project I mentioned is an ongoing project uh, with with Nashville. So thank you, thank you for the partnership there on, on both accounts. So with that, I'll I'll just kind of wrap up. You know, we talked to, we touched briefly on on water equity, and I know Christine's uh, here, and we can we can answer questions around what that project uh, encapsulates. But uh, I hope you got a sense with the network that you're building uh, and for, for those on the, on the line that underneath this umbrella of what we traditionally used to call it an AMI system, now we can start to add other things to provide you some intelligence. And we can also then uh, provide some, uh, some user facing, uh, some customer facing information, uh, some analytics to help you solve things around operations and overflows and flooding. So, it's exciting. It's a, I think it's an exciting time to be 
in our business because you know traditionally we've been all siloed right uh, you go in and you talk to the meter shop lady or you go in and you talk to the water operations guy and i think more and more the, the desire and i think you point out philip the desire is uh, for towns like Cary and, and cities like nashville to utilize this data for other purposes and i hope I hope we gave you a little bit of sense of how that's uh, how that's happening so uh, with that yeah, we'll i really stop, wish Chris, that you guys had been at the beginning of our stuff back in october because this is such a good foundational presentation of, of sort of the whole water ecosystem. Um, a lot of what we got was bits and pieces of it. Um, now, yeah, Christine, why don't you just give us a brief, and I really mean brief because you're gonna, you know, there's gonna be, which I'll tell everybody about, another session um, where we're really gonna go into a different sort of data view of, of all of this. But why don't you just give a brief overview because I think this is a good prelude for some of the work we're gonna be doing. Sure thing. Um... So the water equity lens, we're working with Esri and using a spatial analytical approach to, um, to measure water equity and um, in, in cities, towns, and really working with the utility and then to, to get the data around things like, you know, urban flooding incidents, um, lead line data, affordability data. So we've, we're creating a number of indicators that, that um, align with these pillars of access, benefit, and resilience. And we're then taking data and measuring it and then plotting it on um, spatially on a map so that both the utility as well as key stakeholders. And, and you know, I just want to mention, I was extremely impressed, I mean, with so much that Nashville is doing, including the equity and design uh, framework that, that Nashville is using. So really impressive. But what, what the map aims to do is create visibility into where the community and the utility have made like really positive strides on um, on equity, and then also where there might be areas improvement, with a goal for every uh, city and town that you know your your wealth status as well as your racial status should not be a predictor of your levels of water service. And sadly, across the country right now, they are. And so, what we're trying to do is just use spatial analysis use analytics, use indicators to help utilities and communities have a tool with which they can identify either, you know, kind of problematic areas as well as areas of success and, and help plan around how to mitigate those um, in your utility. And like I said, we're publishing this as a story map with Esri um, in about two weeks. So, uh, you know, to the extent where it's interesting, be happy to kind of come back and, and walk, walk everyone through um, through that one once it's published. So when you talk about water equity and you talked about quality and access, our focus in this particular um, scoping project is um, flooding. So is mm -hmm. that one, are, are there, and, and when we, at the beginning of our plan, Jennifer and Roger were really good about collecting flooding data. So is that included in some of the work you're doing? Um, it is. So flooding in, in, in our case is going to fall under the resilience pillar. And, you know, an important point that's been made to by some water utility chiefs I've chatted with is that um, the presence of flooding is not an indicator of equity. It's a indicator of topography and, you know, your natural geographies. What's an what's an indicator of equity is the kind of amount of program services and investments that are made um, across your utility to mitigate flooding. And so that's kind of the approach we're taking is like, what, what are the investments made? And are there, I'm just looking at the um, chat button too, is that as we're overlaying those with census tract information about uh, wealth, race, um, income, in, in which is kind of representative of vulnerable populations is are the kind of prevalence of flooding um, overlaid with vulnerable populations very similar to the map you showed Phil uh, and and are there are there kind of measures programs and investments being made to um, particularly address those vulnerable areas so no, I, I, that's really fascinating, and that is the direction we want to go in now in 2021. I think we've laid the foundation. Chris has helped us. Um, I'm going to go back to Roger and Jennifer at Nashville. 
and because they use some Esri uh, GIS mapping and stuff, and and maybe there's even a little work we can do, um, you know, before with you, Christine, before mm -hmm. we and then publish it in, you know, and and it may be we have to change the date in which you, uh, but I think there's a real focus here in Nashville about uh, the impact of flooding on these vulnerable populations as mm -hmm. part of the equity lens. So. I really appreciate what you're doing and, and can't say enough for Xylem for pushing in this direction because I think, I mean, Nashville as a leader is saying this is the direction we want to go in. So this is really cool stuff. Does anybody have any questions? Janie, uh, Roger, Tom? <laughs> on saw either Janie's, Christine or Chris? Janie has a note about uh, measuring the benefits piece agreed. Um, we're doing our best, but hey, Christine, can you repeat that question just so everybody knows what Sorry, it is? Yeah, so I was just reading the the chat. So JD okay. Camp, um, the benefits piece is a challenge for quantification, and um, benefits we measure is the number of staff within your utility that work for, or sorry, that are that live in your city boundary, um, your service boundaries, as well as uh, workforce development, training and apprenticeship opportunities, as well as procurement policies, as, as far as the inclusion of um, small businesses, minority-owned businesses, and women-owned businesses, and yeah, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yes. Yeah. And so, that's something also. That, Janie, were you going to say something? Sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to ask. So, when you're talking about benefits, are you purely or predominantly focusing on the economic benefits? Um, are you hmm. looking at any other benefits like the societal benefits or environmental benefits um, when you're trying to compute that? So in our framing right now, and you bring up a really good question, but like we're basically uh, defining benefits as is the, what I would call like the water economy inclusive. And so it's not, it's not going in the direction of um, measuring environmental benefits at this time. It's more the, the, the lens now is, you know, is your kind of water economy inclusive of, of, like an array of all community members and representative. It's not into the kind of more the economics of environmental benefits quite yet. So, that, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so thinking about the context of urban flooding, I could envision us, you know, kind of applying a similar approach to the um, benefit and equity of our projects happening you know, investment projects related to stormwater infrastructure, um, mitigation uh, approaches and those things. We could also, you know, maybe look at that um, an equity lens of where investments happening to mitigate flooding, correct? I, I mean, I think that that area is really interesting because it's kind of about um, the benefits is related to the consequences of flooding Right, like property damage, health incidences, um, block traffic, um, if it's near a hospital, you know, all the schools, lost days of school or work. So that whole area, I totally agree. I think that's really interesting. And the more you can quantify that, the more you can, you know, frankly, you kind of like push for investment to mitigate flooding. And what we've been looking at, and I'll sort of shut this off because I think I think this is an area that Janie and I could take you now for another hour if we were given with Tom and Roger. Um, is so you can talk about, you know, you can you can measure the consequences on infrastructure, on the economic community. But when mm -hmm. we talk about vulnerable populations, one of the things we're looking at is what is their experience of yeah. the disaster. And mm -hmm. um, and that goes to resilience because community resilience is more than just simply building back. It's it's also how does that community withstand? Um, and Tom works on this from the standpoint of uh, buying out programs, and, and we're trying to work with him to come up with some other innovative programs that we can use the data. And it's really data-driven. The key is, can we come up with data-driven approaches that would mitigate the impact? So, you know, like I said, I think we could keep talking about this, but I think we're going to leave it there for the moment um, because this is really, and I can't tell you enough, Chris and Christine, how happy I am that you guys are going in this direction because this is exactly what we wanted to look at, you know, and, and uh, given the fact that you're already doing work with Nashville sort of, you know, sets us up maybe to to keep looking at this. Um, there was, uh, this is Roger, Roger. go ahead, sorry. Sure, and so there was a statement made earlier that, that essentially said that, that, that as you begin monitoring and, and the more you monitor, the more you realize you need to monitor. 
uh, and I think that's really pertinent uh, to this case. Um, and it's it's in, uh, it's interesting the other work that's being being begun in Nashville, because when we look at examples like Carrie, they're they're monitoring so many different components of their uh, across their system, water transportation. You know, they're, they're really a, a, a pretty sterling example of of the kinds of things you can monitor. And a lot of ours is beginning with water. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we've had our flood our flood forecasting system in place for about 10 years. Tom and I are both on standby this afternoon because we expect um, upwards of four inches of rain sometime this afternoon. Um, Chris made a point about the, the incidence of 10 inch rain events and we're averaging about one a year. We get a 10 inch rain somewhere. We had one last September in the Mill Creek Basin um, mm -hmm. similar to Walla Walla and their Mill Creek. We, we yeah. have a Mill Creek that'll flood too. Um, and so we'll watch that. We will watch our Nashville safe flood forecasting tool through the course of the afternoon and into the evening tonight. Um, but but more and more we're seeing storms that that drop as much as eight to ten inches of rain in one drainage basin. And so while it's not a monster flood that covers or impacts 44 counties like our 2010 flood, mm -hmm. it certainly will have impacts uh, in the basins that that receive those events um, so it, it is it's it's a great way to be to be traveling to create this this system with our other water system distribution system wastewater system monitoring um, to to tie that also into our flood monitoring is is a is a more efficient way to to carry that whole project forward to much greater and and we're excited about it. we're still working with dhs and, and in acquiring, um, hopefully soon, uh, acquiring some of the remote sensors for flood level monitors. And we're actually, Tom and I had a discussion yesterday about um, about members, team members that we can use to, uh, to, to install these remote sensors in areas that we know to be problematic that we've never really had active sensor uh, sensors in. So, mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat direction to be going. It really is, you know. I think it creates this virtual loop. I think once once you know what's going on out there, then you can do something about it, and then you can you can measure the results, you know. And I think, uh, and that's what we've seen time and time again is, is people just didn't know what was going on out there because it's out of sight, it's it's underground, it's uh, you know, in a storm we're 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 inside, you know, so we're not often like at a stream or at a creek, but. You're absolutely right. The more, you know, we always say people don't know what they don't know. And, and I think what, what these systems are allowed, allowing us to do is more broadly understand what's going on with utilities, uh, stormwater and such. So uh, it does create, I think, this virtual cycle. It can create this virtual cycle for utilities, forward thinking utilities say, okay, now that we know this, how do we, how do we correct it? And, and your right. point around basins. Yeah. Forward looking Sorry. cities. That's right. Yeah, Nashville, that's right. I mean, Tom and, and Roger and Jennifer were working the water, but it, Nashville is a forward looking city. Absolutely. Um, before I just review our upcoming schedule, does anybody else have questions or comments? Um, I think this is really, um, yeah, this is cool stuff. So just, I think Christine really sort of just everybody can see my screen. What we did today was sort of lay a little bit of the foundation for what's going to be happening in the next two sessions. We're really going to be looking at different data approaches. So Xylem's going to come back in. We have a, a startup called State of Place, and then we also have a startup out of Australia called Neighborlytics that are going to look at different data approaches in assessing, um, uh, or, you know, uh, communities and how disasters affect them. And then um, we still have to determine sort of out uh, dates. But uh, we're working with Tom specifically to come up with some new approaches to negotiating buyouts. We're going to be working on that plan some more that you all saw. And then we have a scoping charrette that, you know, I'm hoping we can get to, to Nashville towards the end of the year when the weather's nice and there's some good music and um, we can do a little bit of work and, and see each other. So with that, everyone, thank you for your time. Uh, this will be recorded. And as I said, if you have any questions about, you can download um, both Chris's uh, presentation and you can download our presentation. And if you have any questions about participating in the program, either here with Nashville, Brisbane, or Orange County, 
please don't hesitate to contact us. So thanks for your time and Nashville. I hope you guys stay safe and it's not yeah. the 10 inch rain. Yeah, good luck. Take care, you guys. Stay dry. Okay. Thank you.